This One Up podcast is brought to you by Dell. Visit dell.com slash gaming for all your gaming needs. From high-end PCs to consoles, games, and accessories, Dell has what you need for gaming. Dell. Go play. And we're back again from Santa Monica here in the Echo Chamber. God, I hate having to balance that out. You have no idea what a pain that is. But this is the One Up Radio podcast special from E3 2007, Part 2. John Davison and Shane Bettenhausen are here with me, as is Dan Shu from EGM. That's Dan Shu Shu. Yeah. <laughs> my, my tag actually says Dan Dan Shoo Shoo. <laughs> so, what? Really? Cool. It yeah. does. It says Dan Dan, Dan Shoo Shoo? Yeah. Wow. He's, he's a pair of shoes. And my Chinese nickname is Fan Fan. So it's Dan Dan Fan Fan Shoo Shoo. Wow. That's, that's, why is your Chinese nickname Fan Fan? That's like a baby Chinese name. Oh. Yeah. Like, I don't know why we're talking about this. Why don't we call this. him Fan Fan around the office then? We I think we will, we will now. now. Oh, that was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> why did I do that? Why did I do that? Fan Fan. So, oh, God. anyway, we figured we'd get this crew together and talk about games since we did uh, press conferences to death yesterday. We'll leave those things buried. But I know that Shane feels compelled to come back and uh, well, g- it, wrap up a couple things. It's funny. When we do this podcast, you think people would talk about you know what we said about the press conferences, what we said about games. But instead, they, they pick really strange things to obsess about. And one of the things, you know, I made that offhand comment about Metal Gear being like possibly allegorical for the you know video game uh, War that's going on right now, and that was the theory. A video of, game war or a real well, life war? The console war, war and, oh. and real life war. But you know, Kojima does work on multiple levels, and he's kind of impenetrable, and he he does a lot of sim- symbolic stuff. And you know, I thought maybe there were little elements of that, but I wasn't actually posing some grand thesis. And what strange people on the boards did, they went back and like tried to pull out things to support this, and everyone got all obsessed about it. I wasn't saying. So the point you were making was the the point the stuff in the trailer that said that uh, that oil was the war of the 20th century and war as is an industry in the 21st century and that's what's needed to perpetuate things, right? Right, and there's more than that, too. But it isn't the first time that he's had in-jokes like that. Like last year's TGS trailer, there's obvious stuff about the the real-life video game console war. But yeah, I wasn't saying that that's exactly what he's saying. I was just tossing that out there. The other thing I wanted to catch people back up on is Mario Galaxy, which... You know, Which I, you hate. I, yeah, apparently, you fully hate. I hate it. As I was walking, I was told that you were visibly smiling while playing it. I was. I was <laughs> smiling. And as I was walking around E3 today, people were coming up to me and be like, "Why do you hate Mario?" I'm like, "No, I don't hate Mario. I, in fact, I really like it. But I'm still not completely sold on the level design based on the levels I had played. But then today, uh, there was a, a, a roundtable and they showed some more levels. They talked about how there are huge planets where it's it's so round. I mean, so big that it isn't round anymore. It's flat. And there are other levels that are like not even on spheres. And uh, uh, Jeremy was saying there's 40 galaxies, 120 like different areas. So uh, apparently the variety is there. So I don't need to be worried about everything just being a little planetoid because that was my fear, you know. And, and I want this game to be as expansive and and cool as like Mario 64. Mm-hmm. And as, as much as I liked Mario Sunshine, I felt it was a little limited by its focus. And I didn't want this game to be quite as limited. So. Okay, so are you saying that you were wrong, or are you just trying to well, make up for people not calling you yeah, out? I, I think people may have mis- <laughs> people may have misconstrued. My wait, 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 wait. Misconstrued. You came up to me and said, Mario, disappointing. You said it just like that. Like, I, I didn't. Uh, you used those words. You were like, Mario, disappointing. You didn't like it. Not, no. I didn't, I'm not saying you hated it. Well, you definitely. I, I think you definitely the, did. I, I'm, you did uh, definitely well, say it was disappointing. I can still be disappointed and think a game is really awesome. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, a listener should understand. Like, I know Shane. We all know to, we have to kind of. Like everything that comes out of his mouth, you kind of have to put a filter on because he exaggerates. Like he's never neutral. He either loves something, he hates something. It's like it's always one extreme. So, so it makes him to... so good on podcasts. <laughs> he polarizes. Well, and then I was at the Barker Hangar at E3 where you go and play games, walk up and play. And oh, I got... by the way, we got to we got we, we'll well, we'll we're going to do Barker. We'll I just want to that in a minute. Right, I want to let people know we are going to cover. But Barker that's where Hanger. Knights was. You couldn't actually play it. Sega would play it in front of you. And the Knights for Wii, the Knights sequel, and uh, and I, I was impressed by that because I expected to be really terrible. And it wasn't terrible because the videos we'd seen previously didn't look very good. And it wasn't bad. In fact, it looks more promising than I expected. So I told Jeremy Parrish that. And he's like, oh, you hate Mario and love Knights. It's like 1997 all over again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, it isn't. So I just want to put clear the air on those two things. You, you need to do a retronaut yeah. with that, definitely. We should. I mean, I, I was actually a huge fan of Knights back in the day. So. You should probably clarify the third thing as well. Oh, yeah. You know, when we're talking about Resident Evil and being set potentially in Africa, we don't even know that. We just think it's set in Africa. And I made a comment that, like, 
Africans are genetically predisposed to be better at marathons. And there is scientific research for that. And I can show you, I can point you to those links. But uh, there's no way is that a racist comment. And like, there yeah, was no intentional racism. No intention of that. And in fact, however, that, this football season, Shane will be doing predictions in, in Vegas <laughs> for uh, who might be winning the Super Bowl. No, I won't. And what's <laughs> no. even weirder about that, that joke is it wasn't entirely my joke. I kind of borrowed... Whose joke was it, Shu? <laughs> so now Shane wants to give me credit for the, for the racist, racist, yeah, joke. No, racist that, that, joke. Not that I'm a racist, apparently. But yeah, Shu, after the Microsoft press conference where they first showed that trailer, you said... So someone pointed out on the boards today that the guy in the Resident Evil trailer is Chris. Yes. Is that true? Do uh, we know for a fact? Well, it's always been presumed from that original trailer two years ago. We don't know that, but it looks like Chris. So it definitely looks like him, and the characterization is definitely but there. Yeah, Capcom has never really talked about this game. No, no. I'm just so I was so glad to see it. Not just because I predicted it, but because it just looks so cool. And you know, it's kind of one one of those things you'd seen a few pictures of here and there, but. It's been going on for a while. You've been thinking about the game, and to have a little more to actually hang your hat on, as far as like talking about the game, is is awesome. Well, I like how unique it looks. It doesn't look like Resident Evil anymore. It that's, totally that's, that's doesn't. Awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I'm really happy about that. All right, so let's dig into some games. I, I for me, E3 started with Mass Effect, and I haven't had a chance really to go crazy on that uh -huh. as much as I want to. It's interesting, because people on the boards were like, "Why aren't people talking about this? Why aren't people talking about that?" And I think, I mean, today and tomorrow, we'll do we'll do a lot of game sp spooging and and potentially hating on. But yeah, Mass Effect is, holy shit. Well, I, I can sum it up real easily, and I've said this to people, and, I, and I was, uh, now I'll just say it in front of everybody, is I am more excited for Mass Effect than I am for Halo 3. And I, I mean, I am a Halo fan. I'm not, I'm not like the, I'm not the uh, Luke Smith Halo fan of the world, but I've been a big fan of Halo. Mm -hmm. I, I've been a big fan of Halo for single player because I, I wanted to see where the story goes. And I am excited for Halo 3, and I think the single player looks really good. But Mass Effect goes above and beyond what I've wanted, like like when I go to play games on my time, it's yeah, that's my entertainment. You know, that's like you, you know you might choose to go you know play a sport or watch TV or read a book, and for me, it's sitting down and playing a good video game and really getting engrossed in it. And God, like it's so amazing how quickly I got engrossed in mm -hmm. in that, especially when the first time using the conversation system. It's so quick to get drawn into, and it's so natural and easy, and and. You know, we've been watching that for a while, and watching them do it is one thing. Because, you know, you watch someone demo a game, and you think, I, you know, I've seen guys demo a game. This guy's demoed this game 50 times. He knows exactly how to go through this segment. He's just doing it because he knows how it works. So what makes Mass Effect's dialogue better than the dialogue trees in KOTOR? Because in KOTOR, you read the dialogue, and then you hear dude on the screen parrot it back. Or they didn't even have voiceover in that, Right, it's they? exactly. Okay. Whereas in this, in this yeah. the, the, the dialogue options, so the, there's the, the people have seen the screenshot. There's that little hub, and it has like six blobs around it with the with the different reactions and the the expressions that, that are written out aren't what he will say they are the sentiment that he will convey and it, I mean it appears that he doesn't even always say the same thing for the same choice there's a right. bunch of things he could because he's responding to what this what this what path through the script is unfolding so it's very so contextual. Be, so it's very contextual and it's picking sound and animation to keep the conversation flowing going in character and also the emotional range is always mapped to the same directions so the top level left-hand corner is always the most diplomatic option, I think. I think that's what they said. And then the bottom right is always the most aggressive. So you can also, you can also play the conversation just by knowing kind of roughly on the, on the emotional range where you want to be going. So you can keep the flow of the conversation going just by tapping the stick and keeping it flowing along. But sometimes it'll just be two words, and he'll spout a couple of paragraphs off those well, two words. What's really cool about the two words is it's not so super high concept where they're like, they don't give you some flowery explanation of of how dude is thinking, it's more like just go dress her down. Mm -hmm. it, it would be it's exactly like what you would be thinking in the back of your head of how you're mm -hmm. going to phrase a sentence. And it you goes it. all the way to, in some instances, kill this person. Like you can like you can finish a conversation just by pulling your gun and kicking him down and shooting him in the head. Wow. But but it, that very much depends on how you've been affect how you've been building the character up to that point because there are elements of your character and your and your stats that impact the conversation system so if you've been building up your charisma a certain way you'll get these blue um, paragon conversation options which 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 will appear as an extra option that you wouldn't previously have had 
where it'll be an extra charming way of doing things. And similarly, if you're being particularly evil and, and you're building and building up all your sort of mean stuff, there'll be extra evil things. Like the killing people pops up when, you, when you've sort of plumbed the depths of being like a real mean guy. So it's not just light side, dark side. It's no. more nuanced. And also, light side and dark side do not balance each other the way they did in KOTOR. You know, in KOTOR, you could be really good, really good and then you could pull yourself back towards the middle. Now you have good and bad stats permanently. So if you've been bad, you can't you can't flip halfway through the game and suddenly become good. You're always going to have those evil deeds in the character's history, and it'll also impact the way certain characters or races will respond to you throughout the game. People in the world are always going to know that you did, you know, that you behaved however it was that you behaved. Yeah, if you're the guy that killed this character and he was instrumental to one of the sort of side paths, anyone with any connection to that will be you're the guy that killed that guy, killed that dude. I'm not helping you. Well, and to like what Garnett said, like in Kotor. Uh, uh, you know, like when you, you can read faster than you can uh, you can hear the entire dialogue thing. So, you could if you read it, you're like, okay, I just skip to the next thing. So you're always cutting off. After a while, right. you're always cutting off the conversation. But in this game, because you don't know what anyone's going to say, it it's plays out like a movie. Like, and it's it's uh, complemented by these awesome animations. Like there, these alien races, these people look real. They have they do the eyes well. Uh, the facial reactions are kind of subtle. You know, it's not just a big smile or a frown. It just it's eerie almost. Mm -hmm. And then so like when you're insulting somebody, uh, like you could just be a smart ass all the time, and you're 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 insulting this big alien about his race and kind of implying that it was a weak race that because they got wiped out. And then just you could tell in the tone of his voice. And even though he's an alien creature and doesn't look human at all. That he's not happy about this. You know, right, he starts so. to really, he starts to lean forward, and you can see him scowl. And we were talking to 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 Greg, and he was like, "There were a few years ago where they were building characters out of sixteen pixels, and now they're able to tweak the muscles around an alien's eye to convey emo like that he's getting angry at you." It's funny that reminds me also of Heavenly Sword, which has really amazing cutscenes where previously people talking wasn't something you wanted to watch, and you would like you know non-moving talking heads in a game you just keep going. But now as like emotions and voice acting get better and better, and like you can watch the faces and looks real it's, it's like watching a movie and it's not so boring to watch people talk anymore mm -hmm. you know? yeah it's weird like you, yeah. you could really sit there and watch people talk yeah. in mass effect and it, it's like you feel like you're watching a sci-fi movie well another thing about mass effect is that here at e3 they debuted this new visual filter which we hadn't seen previously and, and like it's kind of divisive some people don't it's like been it really divisive. i think it looks kind of cool actually. i really like it it's a bit it's a bit <laughs> like the early before the silent hill effects got really wild it's just a film grain really fine noise filter everything and it's and it from a distance, it smooths the edges off a little bit, and I think it's allowed them to do some stuff with the, with the by focusing the detail in some areas and not in others like to keep depth of field stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of shit going on, and there's a lot going on with the focus effects and stuff. But the grain really, it gives it a gritty. It's, I it's, really, really like it too. Because they said they'd been looking at like um, late '70s, early '80s sci-fi movies, and a lot of the the the, the sort of the the grand sci-fi movies, you know, Star Wars in 2001 and Silent Running, and like lots of these sort of big even things like you know um black hole and you know big spaceships and big epic robot fights and sort of and even the music it's like this sort of um 70s analog synth sci-fi music it's very evangelical yeah it's like moog stuff it's like it's very evocative nice yeah, I think we're all in agreement that Mass Effect is one of the best games here. Yeah. yeah so the counter argument, by the way, on the filter, since we're all in, in we all liked it because I've had this argument with Mark and Kathleen, is that they felt like looking at the television, it looked like, like the like there was something wrong with the television. I think it's a little distracting, and it's going to take me getting used to, uh, it, because what, that's all I could pay attention to the first time I'm looking at. It. But I think after you're about an hour in, you probably won't notice mm -hmm. it. You know? Probably not. There's like other subtle things they did. Did you notice that they darkened the edges slightly? Yep. Uh, so it kind of it kind of puts a more of a, uh, it gives a weird depth of vision. Depth they also do a lot with, the, with with that depth stuff and the uh, and fading things out to direct. They were saying that they're using it to direct your attention to something because the Unreal Engine allows them to do so much stuff. I mean, the first thing they showed us when we went down to the planet was um, the, that six wheeled buggy thing that hops around. It gets the Mako. It get, yeah, the Mako. It gets dropped out of a ship and it splashes down into the water, and the water comes up over the entire Mako, and then water droplets drip off it, and it's all in engine. And they're saying when they can render stuff at that detail in engine when there's so much shit on screen you don't know what to look at so the reason they're blurring things out and darkening things is to is to tell you really subtly what your attention should be on because otherwise it would just be overload and everything would be glistening and shiny and sparkling hmm. and 
So we've teased about a billion times that Shane's been playing Heavenly Sword, and it's here, playable. Right. So what, share some impressions now, well, Shane, about yeah, Heavenly I've, Sword. I've played all the things that are here, and uh, it's, it's really... I'm really impressed. Like, I was very skeptical about this game because the, the game these guys made previously was Kung Fu Chaos <laughs> for Xbox, which I did not like. I gave the game a five. I didn't think it was a very good game. And uh, so, yeah, Heavenly Sword, first of all, the presentation, like, they hired Weta, which is the New Zealand studio who did all the special effects for Lord of the Rings and King Kong, to do all the cutscenes and all the voice acting and all the motion capture. And, and it's Andy Serkis doing and a bunch Andy of the characters, Serkis right? Is the, is, uh, he's the main villain, King Botan, and... Uh, it's stunning. I mean, the cutscenes are unbelievable. They're the best cutscenes I've ever seen in any game, bar none. Like, unbelievable. Like, Which is interesting, and a counterpoint of that I want to get to in a minute is talking about Fable, where the vision for that is no cutscenes at all. Right. Well, so, yeah, these cutscenes, you know, they, they bookend the levels, and then when you start the levels, it's, it's a lot like God of War. In fact, the game kind of begins a lot like God of War, and, and the combat... It's it's easy to pick up and just like you're mashing buttons and having fun, but then when you realize, oh, you have three different stances, you have all these complex combos, and you unlock more combos as you go through the game, there's a lot of depth there. It's very rewarding. The only negative I would say to the combat is the enemies aren't that tough to beat. So if you're used to like Ninja Gaiden, you know, the enemies aren't fighting back that hard. Most of the grunts are just grunts, so they're in your way. See, that's weird. Cause I, only, I didn't play it as much as you did, but maybe 10 minutes and i found the enemies were blocking way too much maybe they turned the ai up i i didn't play it here because it looked like the same thing yeah i played it here today and then uh, like the enemies are just well, okay, blocking so much using so the wrong stance because like you have these no things. no i know yeah i was using different stances i did use the range stance and the power stance right but there's actual visual indicators to tell you which stance you should be using to fight oh specific okay I, I might not have how's that work uh, there's a little glow of different colors, and you learn like, oh, if it's a little blue sheen, I should be using speed stance. That's it, what what glows your sword, your like swords, or the like the enemy right before you hit him. And, okay. and there's a lot of audio cues too. Like you can counter most enemies' attacks if you if you attack at the right moment. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's definitely you learn how to how to play this game. But the combat is really fun and, and rewarding. But that isn't my favorite part of the game. My favorite part of the game is the after touch system. When you pick up anything in the game, and you can pick up every object and pick up every enemy. Uh, when you throw them with the X button, if you hold down X, you then become that object, and you guide that object with the six axis. And it's the best use of six axis I've encountered because it's really fun, and it's, it takes you out of it a little bit because you can do things that you wouldn't normally be able to do, like you can steer a cannonball around a corner and hit somebody with it, <laughs> but that's really fun. And there's these parts where you, you're controlling a catapult and you're fighting thousands of troops in a battle, and you're controlling the cannonballs and blowing things up. It's really fun. And you know when you get to a room and you can break the tables and pick up swords and throw the swords at people and kill them and you, you it's, it's really really fun yeah my biggest concern about this game and i haven't had a chance to go play the demo was that just every time they've shown it it seemed like it had a potential to just be an arena game so uh, i mean there is no platforming so that when you first start playing this game and you realize i can't jump for 10 minutes you're like why can't i jump but you can evade the right stick is, is like evasion and the evasion is very effective and you know as soon as you realize okay i'm not going to be platforming and all the there are platforming parts, but they're all those quick time events. They're called uh, hero sequences. But whether there's platforming or not, is there is there actually some like adventuring in the environment, or is it simply cutscene encounters, cutscene encounters? I will say it it is mostly that there is not a lot of exploration and there's not a lot of platforming. You know, it, it's kind of a, a ride that you play through. It so. did seem like God of War. Same yeah, it's pacing a lot. It's as a lot like of fights, basically, where you're just running, running down a run, essentially down a tunnel and having a sequence of battles. Right. But there, there's a lot of variety because you do do. The, do those sequences where you're sniping and there's big boss battles and there's uh, there's, there's different types of, of fights and different types of levels. So the variety is more than you'd expect. It isn't just an arena game. It isn't mm -hmm. the same thing over and over Can again. Can you explain the whole sword thing? I'm still not clear on it. So she has the sword that she's not supposed to have and it's well, killing her, right? So, yeah, at the beginning of the game... I think I'm allowed to talk about this. They mentioned it in the conference, and I okay. and then she had so, like the tattoos come yeah, up the, all over her body. Yeah, the beginning, and... like her tribe is being killed by this giant army, and like you, you begin the game fighting against four thousand troops, and you die because you're, you're outnumbered. She doesn't she doesn't have the the heavenly sword, um, and uh, she decides to use the heavenly sword, which is this god sword that she knows is cursed that her father's been protecting. And mm -hmm. when that happens, she becomes cursed, but she becomes amazingly powerful. But she knows like by using this, she's going. She's going to have to die. It's con constantly draining her health. Is that right? It doesn't drain your health, but it's like it's like you know corrupting her and killing her. Okay. You know, it's it's more just a plot based thing. Yeah. But in, when you don't have the sword at the beginning, you only have one stance. So like when you actually do get the sword, you know it, uh, it unlocks all these other moves. And, you know, oh, okay. It's interesting. But yeah, uh, so far I'm very impressed. We should get the review code soon. I'm looking forward to playing. When's it out? Uh, September 28th. I gotta say though, I also don't agree with you on the combat because uh, I'm catching up on old games. Uh, before I came to E3, I was I'm playing. Uh, 
uh, God of War 2. And it's it feels to me like it moves so much faster that uh, like Heavenly Sword just feels kind of so, a little bit slower and more cumbersome. It's it's still a neat game overall, but I, I kind of prefer God of War 2's combat. It's just quicker, faster yeah, There pace. is a different feel. And the animation, you know, the animation's really elaborate in, in That's in That's this. part of it, yeah. But it's pretty, but it's a little bit of a trade-off because it is, it is a little slower than God of War. Yeah. If, you, if you like these sort of games, I saw a game at THQ, which actually was the best game in their booth area that's not even due out until next year, but it's called Darksiders. Uh, did you check this out at the THQ? No, but I, I mentioned it to Brian, uh, EGM's previous editor, and he said you were crazy. He said yeah. I'm crazy, other really. Other people <laughs> say you're crazy, too. I haven't seen it. Other people are like, well, I had, But I haven't seen it. Whatever. I, I think it's really cool. Like, and number one, it's not even due out till like late next year. It, it already has like some very cool-looking enemy designs. The whole premise of the game is that it starts with the apocalypse and the end of humanity, and you play the uh, you play war, you know, the, which is one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Wait, is this the game that was once the four horsemen of the apocalypse from Acclaim? I, I, it sounds <laughs> 3, similar 3DO? to it, but if it... Video? I, it might, oh my god, but that was... No, that was no one yeah. I was saying. No, that <laughs> couldn't be that. This is like it's their own... Sure. They built their own game engine for this. So you, you play war. They, they're going to redesign the character, because that was one thing I told the guys. Like, dude, right now the character does not look like war at all. So they have to redo that part. But you have, like, your, you have your uh, war horse that you can summon. You, you're basically... Does war look like... Um, like the Jackie from Dead the Darkness. It, actually, right, right, no, right now War looks like War looks like a demonic version of Samus Aran. So I'm like, oh, really? what the hell? This really? is like, yeah. And the game has like a very like very Metroidish kind of vibe to it. it like it, it, right now, it really looks and feels to me like I was watching. I was like, wow, this is like. Metroid crossed with God of War. What an interesting combination. And it is, takes place. It takes place in Earth, right? So, like, he's going around with this giant sword that he can summon, kicking that shit out of these demons, and then he has to also fight angels because you're on Earth, and it's after the uh, after the apocalypse. So the angels and demons are fighting over Earth, and the angels are like super advanced, like technologically, and so then he comes into like an area that's like an abandoned uh, army base or whatever, and he grabs a minigun off of a helicopter and starts fighting the angels after he's just been raising hell on the demons. It has some cool potential. I thought it looked pretty it, neat. It sounds like like something that Todd McFarlane would write. <laughs> it does, sort of. It does sort of sound like that. I don't really mean that in a good way. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? Say, there are a lot of God of War clones here, and it's hard for one of them to stick out, I think. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, Conan. Who's doing that one? Because it's Conan. Conan was right there in the same. Also Conan was right there in the same booth. THQ. And let me tell you what. This is not Conan. Because Conan, Conan is, is just God of Conan or Conan of War. I mean, it's like so no, obviously <laughs> a knockoff. Conan but. of War sounds like Conan O'Brien. <laughs> and there's a don't God, do that God, God, God of, of Hellboy. God of Hellboy. Yeah. God of Hellboy. Yeah. Conan is kind of a How mess. is that? Because when, when they first showed Hellboy, I thought it had a lot of promise. It's by Chrome, and they're, they're a pretty good developer, but yeah. People were calling us out last night for saying, Chrome's a good studio. I'm like, I thought... I've always been impressed I, with what Crumb's put out. I enjoyed Tide the Tasmanian Tiger I enjoyed two. both both one and two, which Crumb did both of them, right? Yeah. Then and then there was King Arthur. That was awesome. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just telling you why people say that, dude. It's because they have games like that. I mean, no, I but say, people were calling out saying Ty is a good game. Well, yeah, Ty was a good game. It was. It really was. A lot of people didn't play it because they thought it was a baby game and didn't want to be seen playing that kind of thing. But it was, it was a more than competent, you know. Jack and Daxter, Ratchet and Clanky kind of knockoff, right? Shoot, I'm curious. Anyway. Did you get the chance to play Little Big Planet? No, I really wish no. that you had. Uh, you got to it, play it. I, I have. Is it at the hangar? Is it at the no? Is it at the oh. the at the hotel thing? Yes. It's not in the arcade. I am going there tomorrow. I'm going to play everything I possibly can in the Sony in oh, the Sony maybe, arcade. Maybe it's not there. Brian played it today. Anyway, you should play it, you because you're the doubting doubting Thomas on this game. So you should right. try that one. I'll look for I don't it. think he's still. You're not really the doubting Thomas completely, are you? I, I'm not as excited about it as everyone else is. I think, okay, part, so I think a part of your insides are dead, Shu. <laughs> uh, that part of my brain died a long time ago. I just, I mean, for, like the last I saw of it was a GDC demo, and I'm like, well, it, it's just like you're just just like charging through a level you know just like jump like it didn't look like it t took a lot of skill you just uh, just run and jump and run and jump like go get him shane just push just push just push eventually you're gonna make it to the end and there's these points where everyone has to work together anyway so it's kind of like well it doesn't matter what kind of lead you have you're gonna have to wait for everybody so you could all do this puzzle and then you restart the race over at that point point. and i understand you know that's just the the one demo they made like there's a lot of possibilities you can make a more you know we just did a preview in egm where they talked 
about we can make they can make levels that are more Mario like where they're really skill based you know so when I see that I think I'll get more excited but from the game developers conference demo I was just like man it, it's sharp looking the textures look fantastic you know those fabrics look real but it's adorable but you know I'm not that so excited I, I haven't played it. it played it here but I can see like I mean, if there's a beta or whatever this year like playing that game more than anything else on PS3 just like you're different though now when you have kids now, now, yeah. now that, now that, you, that, that you have kids you, you tend to look for more when you played with your Shane friend. what did you get to play with I got to I mean, make my own levels with one of the producers and you know it's so easy to use and quick and fun and I, I, all right you, so how to work is it as easy as that? There was a video it's, where it's it was really just going, easy. where it was like select a texture and go. Yeah, I mean, like, and you you know, you've made something. You pick a shape, and, and like when you're picking the, sh- the different shapes and materials, it, something that's there, and you can like using the analog sticks grow it larger, smaller, and just add them, attach them, and just put things on it. Suddenly, everything's. Are you always making essentially two dimensional objects, though? Yes, I mean it takes place on there are three planes, mm-hmm. but you know like, everything is basically two dimensional. But be honest, guys, like you guys are going to go into the editor, you're going to throw some things around, and then you're going to run your guy through it. Like that was kind of cool, and it's really easy. But you're not going to take the time. None of you guys are going to take the time to do a well designed, lengthy, properly balanced, skill based level. No, I'm going to take the just time. Gonna, you're going to throw like, a lot you of can, shit you in can there. Edit other people's levels. You're gonna, I'm going to yeah. run through it, and then you're going to be like, "Well, you know yeah, what? I'm I mean, going to play other levels." I agree with you. I think the average player won't have the time to like from the ground up create a whole level. But you can take other people's levels and edit them and change them. And like, it's really easy to stick things in the level and stick things together and suddenly make a new object. Like while we were there, we like we made this giant dragon car thing and just kept putting stuff on it, and like it's moving around, and you can and then you can give that to somebody else, and they have it in their game. And like you could, so I think it's just so expandable. And like if you talk to the producers, they really don't know what's going to happen with this game. It's it's kind of like The Sims or Spore or something in that it's it's just a big playground and you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. And to be clear, I'm not down on it. I'm not saying it's a bad game. I just I'm not excited about it yeah. as as much well, as. Well, and are. I think your mileage may vary. I mean, if you play a bad level, you might think this game sucks. Yeah. You yeah. Know, so are you, are you saying essentially that you don't think that the audience is going to take to it the way that, that the team thinks they will? Do you think I, ga- gamers are not that? I think that I think well like inclined? everyone who saw the editor like i said i think people are going to get excited you're going to want to try it you're going to do a couple of simple levels but very few of us and we're all pretty hardcore and we're all into our games i think very few of us even will want to design a a you know a proper level that's actually fun for others to play i think i'm going to throw a bunch of blocks on there throw some pornographic stickers on the (laughs) on the blocks and then like ha 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 check this out and then barrel through it and realize like that wasn't really a well-designed stage mess with it some more and then after that i'm like you know what i'm just going to play the levels that came with the game and download some of the best speaking of the stickers and stuff have they said if you can pull photos out of your off your hard drive and apply them to the environment they say they they want to include that and they hope to have ways of policing it so to, to to stop shoe from yes. posting pornographic yeah, <laughs> they, levels. They, they, they hope to have oh it. look at my little cute guy what's he crawling up <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh nice. hey, what's this big veiny mountain <laughs> oh <laughs> <laughs> well, you know there's another weirdly ambitious game that's hidden from view that you got to play john which is fable 2 i did get to play that yes which is strangely which, on the dl like uh, well, it's very, very, very early. Like, he actually opened the demo with, you're going to see a lot of games at E3 at varying levels of, of technical proficiency, and I absolutely guarantee that this is the worst tech demo well, you will see. And he being ultimate over over-promiser Peter Molnu mm-hmm. promises the world every time. So we open, I mean, again, it's very sort of grand, you know, I want to challenge the very foundation of how how you play video games and, but he, I mean, you've been saying that I've changed because I've got kids. Peter Molyneux, I think, has changed because he's got kids. I think <laughs> there's a lot of people in the industry that you're hearing about where, because they're they're getting older and they've been around games a long time and they're at a different point in their life now, you you could see it starting to affect the way they're approaching the design of the games. And I think this is what's happening here. The two things that he wanted to do is he wants. Anyone to be able to pick up—it's like it's a big, intimidating role-playing game. But he wants anyone to be able to pick it up and get something out of it, and to be able to enjoy it. And then the other thing was—I um, don't know if you've ever—I mean, do people listening have ever heard Peter Molyneux talking? He's sort of, you know, this very polite Englishman who's a bit C-3PO like in the way that he talks <laughs> about things. And he's sort of. So I was watching uh, uh, Casino Royale, and I was watching James Bond getting hit in the bollocks with that uh, with that huge rope thing, and it dawned on me that in movies the hero never dies. 
And he's like, and he pauses, and he's like, so that's what I was going to do in Fable 2. So you never die. You never die in, in Fable 2. Which, which everyone was, there was like five people in the room as he was doing this, and everyone was sort of like, yeah? And he's like, because the, the death mechanic in video games has been essentially the same since Donkey Kong. It's like you die, and you go back to the beginning of the level, and you start again. So what happens in Fable is um, there's a lot of, he said, like 50%, 60% of the game is combat. And some of the combat is five or six guys, and there's a, there's a lot of the way that it scales is that you know there are there are fights that you 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 can wander into that you really shouldn't. So the way that it, it sort of scales the the character stuff is that it you, you don't really want to go and engage on something that you shouldn't. But if you do get beaten down, um, instead of dying, you fall and you're like you're lying on the ground, and you depending on the 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 character attributes, you will eventually get up. What? Um, you will eventually get up. You fall and then you wait. You will eventually get up on your own. And but if you want to get you have up, a metal alert bracelet and what you do right, is you shut hit the shut button. Shut up and let me finish. <laughs> the um, if you want to get up faster, you can trade experience or gold or something in your inventory in order to get up faster. So you, you're in this fight. You get beaten down. If you want to get up immediately, then then you need to trade experience points to get up. If you don't get up and you have to wait to get up, what? the characters continue to beat on you. And and over the course of you being being beaten, any any injuries that you sustain while you're lying on the ground are permanent for the entire life of the character. So you have these scars. So you have scars. You become disfigured, and the more disfigured, like does it affect your stats? Yeah. So the more disfigured you are, anything on the on charm or personality is affected by your physical appearance. So if you're lousy at combat and keep walking into fights that you shouldn't get into, you'll get beaten up. And you won't be able to engage in missions that require, like, charm or personality or persuasion or because people will take one look at you and they'll think that you're a soldier or you're some kind of, like, evil character. And you, because you, you get, like, really fucked up, apparently. And, like, there will, people will take one look at you and they're not going to want to do anything with you. So the consequence of falling in battle is more than just losing something and starting again. It's there are parts of the game that will be way more difficult because of the way that you look. I like the Donkey Kong style better <laughs> because uh, so you you have to make I like a choice. The prey style better. Do you, do you want to you want to give up some of your experience points, which no one's going to want to do? I mm -hmm. don't want to do to that. To get up faster. To get up faster. Otherwise, sit there and then just, get, and just continually take, and, get and penalized. Yeah. So you can get you can like wander into fights that you you know you need to pick pick your battles. Essentially, is what you need to do. Is you only need to wander into a fight that you think you have a pretty good chance of of, of pulling off. And the way that it guides you is that it won't just dump you in the middle of a fight that you can't. Well, so that part's a good idea where it kind of makes you a little bit more tentative and afraid because mm -hmm. we, we know, okay, well, if this boss is too big for me, I just reload the last save. It's right. like, uh, it, it makes you a little bit more cautious. Maybe that's a little bit more realistic, but still it's like, you know, when you die and crack down and you lose some of those orbs that you've built up, it, it kind of sucks, you mm -hmm. know, like, well, like in Sonic and the ring, you don't pick up all the rings after yeah. they burst out of your body. I mean, it's taking that, I guess that idea to the, but, but like in, in Fable, like that's all you want to do is level up your character and build mm -hmm. a stronger character. I don't want to, Go take but a if you're wandering back. in this, if you're wandering into fights that you shouldn't, you are essentially committing to a more combat-oriented story for yourself. Here's what here's what's odd to me about this is, on the one hand, you have the option of spending experience points, which is a very like abstract game mechanic sort of idea. But if you don't spend them, then you take damage to your you know to your avatar in the mm -hmm. game that impacts your game as if you were actually laying on the ground in the game environment being beat on. But it's not like I'm just like paying some magic fairy to lift me off of the ground with experience. It's just weird. That's a weird trade-off. He yeah. didn't, he didn't, like he didn't define specifically what the cost would be. He said, there will be a cost to getting up immediately or getting up very quickly. And he just said, it'll be gold or experience or something. I haven't thought of it yet. It was, very, it was a very sort of Peter Molyneux moment. You know, it was like, yeah, there'll be something that you do. What worries and me is he has these really wildly ambitious innovator concepts, but then you say like the actual mechanics of the game, it doesn't look very good, and you, you don't even think it's going to be out in the next six I don't months. Think it, I didn't know. I mean, it's very early right now, and they, he did the other thing he demoed was the one-button combat. So, melee attacks are mapped to the X button, ranged attacks are mapped to Y, and magic is, is mapped to B. And everything is based on combinations of pressing one of the buttons and a direction. And it's all contextual and all procedural. There's no like predetermined moves. So if you hold um, the X button, he'll do a block, and it's context sensitive to both the environment and to where the characters are and then it'll break the camera off the action and try and show the fight in the best possible place 
And then as you're doing these sort of, like, if you, you can press and hold to do a block, and then from a block you go into a move that's more spectacular, and you start chaining these, these moves together with directions. And when you're fighting multiple people, it, it's based on who you're pointing the stick towards as to what he'll do. So he'll, if I'm, if the two of, if I have one of you on either side of me, and if, I, if I'm blocking and holding towards Shu, I'll, I'll hold the sword up like that, and, and if the guy on the other side rushes towards me, I'll try and push him with my hand. And it's all, it's all based on relational to where he's standing. And the other thing is, it's, it, the, the environment plays into it in a big way as, as well. So um, if I'm walking along and there's a bottle on a table and I hit the ranged attack, if I don't have a gun or a bow and arrow, I'll just pick up the, I'll pick up the bottle and throw it at the nearest guy in the environment. And so everything is based on that. And then this gradually ramps up until eventually it becomes the demo that... Was there a video of the demo he did at GDC, the bar fight with the stick figures? I didn't see one, but... Where so. He had this vision of a bar fight that was like an Errol Flynn movie, essentially, where it would be using everything in the environment as part of a fight, and you could have this spectacular, like, old-school movie sword fight swinging on the chandeliers and throwing bottles and stuff getting broken and everything, and someone could do it by essentially just doing it with one button. And he said they have that working now where if you you can jump you know he'll jump up on a table and if the if the fastest path to attack the character that, that you're facing is to leap on the chandelier and swing and kick him then that's what the character will do but everything's based on the physics and and it's all procedural based on on where you are so very often it you know you'll hit a button and he might do the character might do something unexpected all you know is that the attack is going to be on what you were intending to attack so the question starts to become how much do you want to have to be responsible for actually making the cool shit that you see on screen happen mm -hmm. and he handed it over because he goes what i want to do is i'm going to get you into the middle of a fight and i'm i'm going to pause the game and i'm going to give it to you and i'm not going to tell you what to do and i want you to he's like i don't like but i don't like button mashes i don't want you to just mash it he goes you can play it like that but if you want to see the cool moves then you need to be thinking about how you're pressing the button and it was it was kind of interesting because you I, you could push a guy against the wall and then hold the button down and he'd force his sword up on the guy's throat and then you could do you could pull the stick away and while he was finishing that guy off he would move around and attack the guy behind him and he'd do things like you'd see him blocking and then as a guy came towards him he'd throw his sword from one hand to the other and then start attacking the other it was ve it's all very like old errol flynn movie kind of stuff and it's quite satisfying. Even it, It's not just, I'm just going to jab on one, but it's not God of War jabbing on a button and just doing the same attack over and over and over. It's quite graceful, and it's quite slow. It's very sort of dancey in a way. Is it like Assassin's Creed's combat? No. I, I haven't played Assassin's Creed, but I would... I think the principle behind it, from well, how people have described Assassin's Creed, is very similar because that's very procedural and, and right. context. It's very context sensitive, from what I've heard. And this seems to be something that a lot of people are doing now. And that the, the, the to be accessible is is to is to think of the controller differently. I mean, at the beginning of the demo, he, Molly was like, "We we have not got everything we can get out of these controllers yet. This thing has like whatever it is, twelve buttons on it." And we're, we're not doing it. So one of the things is the things, and this is what the Halo Wars guy said as well, is you don't want to change where things are. You always want certain behaviors to be the same thing. So in Fable, the D-pad is, is an emotional response, and X is always a melee attack, and Y is always, you know. So the emotional stuff that he talked about was um, if you want to be a real dick in the game, you can use the emotions as well as the as the well as the aggressive stuff. And he was talking about there's an old woman who's talking about her son who is lost in the forest, and she's telling this terrible, terrible story. And he goes, if you tap left on the D-pad, your character will start laughing, <laughs> and uh, and the and the and the woman will respond to the fact that you're laughing at her story. So he said, you know, you have a laugh and a cough and a fart, and it's like various <laughs> things mapped to the D-pad. He's big on having the farts yeah, in there. And, and yeah. based on what you, what you do while other people are doing things, it will affect the way that they perceive you. And it's a bit, I mean, it's taking a lot of the ideas from Fable and just like pushing them as hard as he can. It's very ambitious. Yeah. And so you, you have high hopes for it, or do you think he's going too far? I, ad I admire his vision, and if he pills off some of it, like, like Molyneux for the last 20 years, He'll throw out these great ideas. Some of them will work, some of them that don't. The ones that do work, we're going to see in every game out there in two years, you know? Right. All right. Well, that sounds like a good plot to uh, take a little break. In a minute, when we we'll come back, we'll talk. Uh, we got to get some Halo Wars in there since I know Shu got to play a little Halo Wars. I saw Wars. you playing Crisis today. I did play some Crisis today, and then we talk about sandbox games. We can't leave sandboxes without talking about burnout. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So don't go anywhere. Stick around. We'll be right back.
This One Up podcast is brought to you by Windows Media Center. Your Xbox 360, your music, your photos, your TV shows, and your videos with one connection. All right, we're back, and I, I misspoke myself a little bit. Shu did not actually get to play Halo Wars, but you did get to check it out, which not many people have done either. So give us the skinny. How's it looking? So if you're a Halo fan, I think you're going to re- – and you like RTS games, obviously, real-time strategy. Yeah, obviously, you're going to like it. And, and I know that's just, like, the simplest thing to say. It's such an easy thing to say, but it, it's really like – you know, they took all the source material – uh, they did it really well. Like all this, they took the original sound files from Bungie. So, like for example, when your troops meet up with a group of uh, grunts and elites, it sounds like a real Halo fight. You know, like what you see in the first, per- what you hear in the first-person shooters. Like the needlers sound like needlers uh, from the firing of the needles to when it hits you and it, the crystals kind of break apart and stuff. The warthogs, they sound exactly like the game, the Halo 2's warthogs, and they even had the same suspension and same physics. Like yeah. when it's the same physics tail. system. They showed a um, um, there's a break in the environment in the demo level that they showed, and yet they fired these two warthogs, and they like both hit the lip, and both pushed up into the air, and then bounced down the other side. And the way they hit on the other side, they landed on their front wheels and almost like bounced over forwards before crashing back down. So there's like real. W- they look like the vehicle. It looks like you're watching a Halo game from like a hundred feet yeah, in the air. Yeah, exactly. Cause the physics are exact. Like when you, when you run into people, when the warthogs flip around, it it, it does. Feel feel like Halo, just you're watching it from a really far distance. Is the camera angle any different than you'd expect? Does it zoom in at times or anything? Uh, You can change it. You could do the typical, like, just like Command & Conquer and Lord of the Rings for uh, 360. Uh, You could spin it around. You could zoom in a little closer, a little farther away. Uh, But that's that's the thing for me. It's like, once you get past the Halo stuff, uh, we didn't get to see a whole lot in terms of, like, why this is a special... I want to go back to the camera stuff, though, because they talked about this a little bit, and the way that it's set up and the way that it, the, the game itself handles the camera is very is different from CNC, and they said that if you if you're not experienced with an RTS game, you will never have to touch the right stick to move the camera, because its its default setting is actually quite close into the combat, and it's it's a bit more skirmish and com- company heroes like in the way that it's like these series of they're not these huge battles, the stuff that they showed. I mean, there were there was some sizable stuff, but it wasn't like thousands of troops all piling into each other. But the way that the camera is set up is that it's always looking at the the action from from a good vantage point. And they said that you you will be able to play it without having to worry about spinning the camera or getting disoriented or anything. And it's the levels are very the stuff they showed was this sort of sequence of events. So what would happen? I didn't catch that part. Like, is there a, something you do to zoom in on? Well, you can what, zo- you can can zoom in and out, but they said that in what they found was very confusing when they were looking at, at things like CNC was when you start spinning the camera, you start to lose track of where everything is in the world, and it's because it's, it's not it's not as easy as like skipping a mouse around and being able to know no, where you are. All. You like get lost in it. So what they wanted to do was build the level and build the camera system so that you don't have to do that kind of thing in order to in order to, to play the game and see what's going on. How much did they talk but, about the control scheme? Because that was like the th- the reason that they said Ensemble wanted to do this game was that they had figured out the way to do It's really simple. There's like none of the holding down the trigger and then popping one button and hitting the other. It's she, she very loves that in Lord of the Rings. I think they did it really well because I, I'm able to like access groups, heroes, powers. Uh, so they didn't really have to Take strip anything away from a PC game to make Lord of the Rings Battle for Middle Earth 2 for 360. Uh, everything's just uh, in you know in the palm of your hands. But in Halo, it is simpler. It's like you know you could double tap A to select all units uh, on the screen, and you could draw. It has the paint feature where uh, it, it draws a big circle, and then if you just move the circle around the units on the screen, everything it touches selects that group, mm-hmm. and then then you have this bigger group available to you. Or you know you can. Uh, I think there are ways to select all units. You can, yeah, type. you can triple tap, and it'll select every active unit. In in the game world. I don't think I've ever triple tapped in my life. I was yeah. saying, new, new thing to do now, triple tapping. So it was like, you can do, you can like do that and it, everything in view will go and then you do it again and it'll like, every, every a unit that's available, 
you can say because like the the demo ended with um what was it called a scarab a scarab yeah which is this big robotic four-legged thing with this huge fucking plasma cannon that's like burning up the environment and like destroying everything in its path and this sort of lot of fire and he said if you if you wanted to at that point you can select every active unit and just point it on that one thing so how are the graphics compared to cnc and lord of the rings the graphics are really good they're really detailed like like from a di- like from our vantage point you can say like those are grunts those are elites there's a banshee ghost like it's very clear very sharp and uh like there are little cool touches too as you expect in a real time strategy game like when you when you pan over the marine base like behind the barracks you'll see a drill sergeant and you'll see a, a, a play, uh, like four or five guys doing push ups and and then in another uh, I don't know what this building does but it had a crane moving crates around and they put it on a uh, they put it on a ground onto a conveyor belt uh, you see this missile that's sitting in a base under partially underground and there's steam coming out of it and uh, you know a lot of little touches uh, uh, so it's done really well, but I, I think really honestly, besides this, the scarab was really cool, and you know they ended the demo with an orbital. Uh, they call it a Mac gun mm-hmm. from your ship that's orbiting in space. It's a magnetic acceleration accelerator, accelerated cannon, whatever. So it blasted down and destroyed the scarab. But if I was to replace all those units with generic soldiers or uh, you know aliens or whatever and just call it something else i don't think anyone would really care you know it's it's pretty straightforward real-time strategy game it's, you know? it's a halo it's halo it's for halo i my, my take on it was that this is for halo fans it's for halo. not for rts fans i mean yeah. you know you might you might get sucked into it if you're into rts but the primary audience is the Four million people that are going to buy Halo Three that want more Halo. Yeah, but I mean, there's probably a lot we didn't see. You know, yeah. to be a, to be fair. Yeah, I mean, the demo they showed it, and, it's it's a, and then they were like, "Oh, that's it!" And like, oh, really? That was like five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> when's it due to come out? Not till next year, right? They yeah. didn't say, but yeah, it's next year. I mean, right. so they're going to give it some space between three and this. Yes. Which makes sense. It gives you a chance to come back to Halo and get yeah. excited about it. And I guess now that we've seen a little more single player, there's more to be excited about. I guess that was the big relief is that everybody who went and saw Halo 3 and single player, the response overwhelmingly was, wow, it looks so much better than the multiplayer mm-hmm. beta. Actually, mm-hmm. speaking of like the, the Halo universe, before we go off, we, um, me and Patrick met with Shane Kim today, and he categorically said there will be no Halo 4. Really? Yeah. That they are done. Do you talk a lot about the Peter Jackson game project? Yeah, which I assume is Halo Chronicles, which has been, been, been named it a few time. times. It sounds like that's what the Jackson thing is. But that's the future. And the, the reference to Star Wars, that that's kind of what they were talking about. And that not only is, at the moment, the intention is the integrity of the core trilogy will remain the core trilogy. But does that open the door for Halo Episode 1 with Jar Jar? Mm, potentially <laughs> down the road, maybe, when they decide they want more money, that's what they do. But for, but after Halo 3, the, the Master Chief story is done, and everything that they do will be support stories that, that are pre-Halo, post-Halo, you know, but not in that core story. That Which we didn't mention, Halo Wars is, it's a prequel to the Halo How trilogy. How many years is it? 20 years before the events of Halo 1. Right. So does that imply that perhaps Master Chief dies at the end of Halo 3? I don't know, but Master, that, like, Master, that is, like, Halo 3, it is done, it is over, it's like the Star Wars trilogy, it's a complete unit, we're not going to fuck with that. That explains the cliffhanger ending of, you know, Empire Strikes Back slash Halo 2. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, you're such a cynic. So, yeah, single player. So you saw it. What do you think? Does it really look that much better? What, what's, your, what's your impression now from Halo 3 single player? Halo 3 looks really, really good, but it's a subtle beauty. You know, it's not like an immediate when you see Unreal Tournament 3 or Gears of War. You know, that's those are the kind of games where immediately you're like, wow, holy shit, this game looks good. Killzone 2 is mm-hmm. even a bit I mean, of that. UT3 is almost like graphical sensory overload. There's so yeah. much crazy things in your face. It's so ornate. Uh, the, the, the levels are so realistic, so gritty. Uh, Halo's not like that. It's it's The problem is uh, why it's not as immediately obvious that Halo 3 looks great is because it's it's a different art style. It's more colorful. Like, you know, like they're brutes wearing shiny purple armor. Oh, yeah, Sean Elliott was making fun of like the rainbow skittle color, you know, of Spartans and how it's taking <laughs> out of the game yeah yeah so it's it's a different art style but uh and the problem with the microsoft press conference video they showed uh they showed this i don't know if everyone saw it but they just showed a bunch of quick 
flash clips of Halo 3, you know, just like a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there. And it was really, no one came away impressed with that because you couldn't really see anything. Yeah, we got on them yesterday for that. I mean, that was way too clip, way too cut up. And, yeah, and but, when, but when you, if you can sit and watch the game being played, like, it's pretty good. It's beautiful because, like, you're, you're we, we saw this jungle level and the sun's poking through the leaves, through the branches, and, and it's like this soft, so it's not, not this, like, harsh game lighting it's like it's very soft and subtle and then it casts these uh nice shadows on the ground when you're in this cave there's these red lights that cast a, like a, a realistic glow uh all the textures are really sharp the jungle looks really full like it, you know it doesn't look like video game trees or branches or leaves or anything it's not like, like that. the perfect dark jungle <laughs> but, uh, then again it's also not like the crisis jungle we'll talk about that tomorrow yeah but yeah, yeah definitely we get some of the pc guys on for that so john did you see the halo th you saw halo 3 I also saw, i saw both of them yeah. so I mean, what would you what, what's your takeaway from it exactly i mean it's exactly the same you need the, the, the this is why i was saying yesterday i thought the trailer that they showed was lousy because it, it does not allow you to see what is good about halo 3 because well, there was only you, like you there can't was, catch there was it like in a those three second clip of like yeah. the arbiter fighting with master chief and they should have shown like a lot of that so the the, <laughs> the mission that they showed us it was going through the jungle and and you are part of this fight it's not a squad but it is a, a fighting force of marines and the arbiter is there and he's talking and he's like saying oh i'm gonna go over here and i'm you know oh they're you know and the, there's this constant chatter between the unit and the marines are shouting at each other and, and then you, you know as the, the grunts are the jungle thing they saw well, the grunts are asleep so, you, so as your squad enters this, the outskirts of this of this Covenant base, the grunts that are on that are that are on watch out and everything are like leaned up against trees and they're asleep. So you can actually sneak in and like smack them with your rifle butt and start taking out the the sort of outer defenses like silently before you actually start the battle properly. But then there's a ton of these cre the ton of Covenant in there and you you work your way to this big set piece at the end of this thing that they showed. But it's uh, the the thing that that really showed off to me. They went from that, which is with all the cool lighting, so they showed the uh, what's it called, sand trap, sand traps. Yeah, which sand traps. Huge, huge like, desert environment with these ruins under the sand, and while you're playing, the sand is getting kicked up by the wind, and like it's this huge environment. And when you see the stuff using the um, the saved films video editor, and you can freeze the action, you actually you can freeze it mid effect. And you can see how subtle and cool some of the stuff is and why you, why you really want to play this in, in high def and on a big screen. Because there's these cool sort of like little trails of light and the way that the explosions are and the way that everything is, you know, the, the laser bolts and plasma flashes and everything. They're like, I mean, it's, it's beautiful. And it's like so high definition and so smooth and the effects and everything just add this extra layer to it. And the funny thing is, like save like replays and save films. It's it's not a new concept, right? Like people have done replays in hockey games, basketball games, football games. Uh, we just saw I just saw Tony Hawk's uh, Proving Ground today, and they have a really awesome uh, film editor in the game, and you could put together close ad effects and all this stuff. It's nothing new, but what I, I'm like, why isn't the Tony Hawk uh, like taking snapshots or video of yourself skateboarding? Why isn't that as cool as a Halo? thing is because you've never had replays of games where there's conflict you know like people love a, a replay in madden where it's like oh check out this catch this one-handed catch and i land my foot my foot's inbound or i look at this tackle but it, in halo it's awesome watching like okay here's this guy driving a warhog and he doesn't see the sky on the hill with a spartan laser aimed right at him and then you could stop it right at the moment where the jeep explodes and your body's flying and you could pan around it 360 mm -hmm. degrees and look at it from any angle and you could see all the action from another perspective and it's right, just when it's you're different. playing multiplayer you only you mean obviously you only ever see your view of the fight and and the people that were fighting alongside you but you don't know what's going on, on the other side of the map and in these things where there's a ton of people playing you could you can like okay well this was me and i'm going to watch what happened to me oh now i'm going to go over here and you can see this this i mean particularly the comedy moments when people and these like you know oh we didn't see that coming and like people setting traps and stuff for people there's pieces of the action that you're never going to be you were never aware of previously that now you can just go and 
check it out and see how people handle yeah. it. And it's like a moment of like, if you're playing in first person, someone comes up behind you and assassinates you. You just get the message and you just see your body slump over. Mm -hmm. But now, if you see a replay and you see your buddy coming up behind you and then taking a hammer and well, smashing yeah, and you, well, you like can it. see how long he was behind you. Yeah, and you didn't notice. And it's the kind of thing where you're all sitting around watching it and everyone's like, oh, you know, it's just it's a different. Do you see what's happening here as these guys talk about it? It's like this is like the mark. This is really cool thing to like watch observationally is like the more you guys talk about it the more your eyes light up and the more like into it you get it's i like, can see a lot of people like spending an awful lot of time watching these videos because i think the other thing is you will be able to get better at halo 3 by watching save games mm -hmm. like yeah. by watching your own save i mean it is the coach going back to the locker room and like watching the videos of the game to find out what the other team was doing this i mean and it's built into the game and Every single game is saved. You can choose to keep it or not keep it, but it, the default thing is it's saving all of the data from every game. They said if you're playing like a six-hour deathmatch, it will eventually choke because there's only so much that the hard drive can take. But it's not saving video. It's saving data. So the files are really tiny. So this is why it can't spit video out to you know, a Microsoft youtube kind it's of thing. Save state. It, it's it's safe state. It's, it has to be in the game engine, and the game engine will process it. But every single game you play can be saved and then you can go and you can go back and watch it and work out so you can like if i get in a game with you guys after i've played it and i didn't do very well i could sit and i can i can go and work out why you're better than me because you know how you play mm -hmm. a certain map and then i can go back afterwards and if if I, if I notice that you have certain habits in a map i'll be able to exploit that yeah yeah. So I'd say from the enthusiasm, it's not going out on a limb here to say you guys think that the excitement's warranted. That it's going to be. When we were talking about Halo being intimidating as a multiplayer game, and yeah. that they must be doing this is one of the things they're doing to make it make it better for people that are inexperienced. It's not about the playing; it's the after you play stuff that's going to help. Well, there's obviously a lot of people here at the show that are interested in like catching into the uh, let's do multiplayer and campaign based, you know, futuristic. Uh, First-person shooters. We Shu got a chance to play multiplayer, where we, we did here today uh, this afternoon. Fracture, and uh, <laughs> I don't know. That's the, the the whole deal on that is they're they're saying that they want to make that a big mainstream game, right? And you were, <laughs> John's got that look on his face. That's not going to be a big mainstream game. <laughs> why why do you say that? Well, for a start, it's a it looks very. I mean, I, I admittedly I didn't see it as much. I didn't play it. I was watching you guys play. It looks like a very derivative sort of. But arena shooter with yeah, environmental it, effects. It has this whole shtick, yeah, like you can, has, you can like destroy big chunks of the environment. Right, someone like, went back and played Magic Carpet from 15 years ago or whenever the hell it was and went, hey, that was kind of cool. Well, it's drawing off Red Faction, right? And Red, I mean, well, Red yeah, Faction was Red the Faction Geo. This is like the spiritual successor to that Geo mod sort of But it's, I mean, it's pretty extreme. I mean, it's like craters or like you can shoot things. And What was that thing where you're doing where these huge pillars were coming out of the it's ground? It's a spike grenade. You drop it on the ground and it, it raises this tall... Uh, skinny pillar of rock, uh, but it's really designed like I, I couldn't think of a way practical use that's for it. But they said what you do is you stand on it because it glows before it does it, so you know where to stand, and then you and then it raises you up like 20 30 feet into the air for a better, uh, you know, if you want to snipe, if mm -hmm. you want to have a better vantage point. It struck me as a gorgeous tech demo that it doesn't strike you know, sometimes you can tell this game's going to do really well. It was just like, no, I can't see anyone going to, no one's going to buy this game. Well, I was talking to Michael Donahoe uh, from EGM about this, and he goes, he wasn't that excited about multiplayer, but he really likes the game because he said in a single player, and Garnett, you saw more of the single player than yep. I did, uh, it, there's, there are puzzles, there's ways to try to figure out, how, like, how am I going to get into this space that's based a, around moving the earth? You know, mm -hmm. like, you got to drop the land so you can get underneath the uh, base wall, or you got to raise yourself up so you can reach another point. So there, there's, you have to think about it. But in, in multiplayer, my problem with it was, like, like, well, I did see Michael do something cool. Like, some guy was shooting him, and he was reloading, so he dropped, uh, I forgot what the grenade is called, whatever one that raises the land. He drops one in front of him and creates an instant wall to protect him from the incoming shots, too. and then he kind of hid behind it and let himself heal. So that was kind of cool. And what I was trying to do was drop the other grenade that sinks the land to, uh, like, if an enemy was close to me, uh, because what happens in the game is it, it, it takes you longer to run uphill than it is to, to run downhill. So if you on higher ground, higher elevation, you have the tactical advantage. But 
what happens is people start throwing grenades and people are shooting. It gets a little confusing, I think, because the, the your your stage, the battlefield you're on, is constantly changing. And if you're in the middle of like grenades doing opposite things, like oh, to your left the wall, the ground's going up, and to your right the ground's That's going insane. down. It's like I don't know where I am all of a sudden, and then someone throws in a vortex grenade that puts you in a little mini tornado. It's just like I'm like I don't know what's going on. But like to be fair, I was talking to uh, one of the president of the developer uh, and said, you know, he asked me what I thought. I'm like, well, I'm really confused. I don't know what's going on. But part of that's like because the frame rate's really bad right now. And, you know, they have another year to work on that. So hopefully that will be smoothed it's out. another year? Oh, yeah. It's not, yeah. Yeah, it's not even due to Oh, wow. In that it, case, maybe they will get that going to do. All right. It's really early. So, like, when the frame rate smooths out, you'll, you'll have a better idea of what's going on. And then they need the like, little stuff that you're used to, like the messaging, like you got killed by who so-and-so or you killed so-and-so. Like, I couldn't tell if I was killing people half the time like if they were uh, you know the ground was raised and I don't see it, they're out of sight and I, th I don't know if my grenade worked or not but there are a lot of little indications and things that they need to tweak yet yeah, the thing with single player so far for me is that the backstory is pretty cool, but the actual character that you're playing so far hasn't been fleshed out nearly enough for for like Luke, LucasArts, who portrays, has said all along, hey, we want to make this all about the character and have great characters. They haven't been pushing that at all. They've very much been pushing the tech, which is why I think it comes off as a tech demo. And number two, and this was the big hang up in Red Faction, is that this sort of gameplay mechanic leads to too much and it often leads to too much in a design where, oh, well, look, there's a metal plate. Oh, I throw the spire grenade underneath it, and it pushes the metal plate up, and that lets me get through. Oh, look, there's a little bit of a hole. I throw the grenade that makes the ground sink, and I make the ground sink and go through, which is kind of cool when you're showing it, but an entire <laughs> game of it. Derivative innovation? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like, if you played Red Faction, you knew that, like, there were places that you just knew, oh, I'm supposed to break through I'm at a dead here. end, and there was no apparent uh, other path. Right. I went what I'm supposed oh, to do. Oh, I need the rocket. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, if they can, if they can mature the game design and the level design as they have with the idea of like how much train tough formation they've done, then they could be onto something. And if they can couple that with, you know, a really cool character that matches up with the kind of interesting backstory that they've done, then they're onto something. Yeah, they didn't make you, They need to make you feel like you're smart for figuring out yeah, what to do. Definitely, yeah. definitely. And not just, oh, look, there's the middle plate. I wonder how I get around this. Uh, whatever. Um, so, you know, if they're going to hit mass appeal, I don't know. It's going to be tough. And it's going to have to be less fiddly. I mean, it seemed like there were a lot of controls to learn there. Mm -hmm. A lot of different stuff. They might they might want to consider, I hate to say this because I'd hate them to take stuff out of it, but they might want to consider simplifying some of the overwhelming number of choices that you have there with like all the up and down and spire and vortex. And I think that we're, we're talking about this more than it deserves. Alright. <laughs> right. Well, I know one game. Alright, I'll move right out of that one into one I know you're ready to talk about as much as we want to, which is Burnout, because oh. you came back oh. glowing from oh. playing that thing. i played a lot of Burnout over the years, and I mean, I know a lot of people have said they have Burnout, Burnout. But John, you recall, I... Like Burnout before you liked Burnout. Yes. Really? You, when Burnout One, Shane liked the crappy Burnout. When Burnout oh, One no. came into our office, Acclaim brought it by, and John's like, "What's that terrible music?" And I was like, "This game's really good." <laughs> yeah. But Wait, they were never terrible though, right? They were never terrible. The I, they no, were just, the music, was, the music was, was, was terrible. Mario's it was terrible. <laughs> and the only ones, it would, it, the way that it would force you to watch the crashes and everything, and they weren't as visceral and and fun. And then sort of Burnout by Burnout, Burnout Two was much better, and then Burnout Three was yeah, awesome. That was the coming out party. And then Burnout Revenge, Revenge was obviously great, and Dominator. You know, less said about that better. This is, I mean, I. D d he said, "Oh, just you know, just try it out." And it's, I mean, it's all open world for a start. So there's moves that you've not been able to do in Burnout before, like you have handbrake turns and everything, and it's very exaggerated physics. So did you do parking? Yeah, you, you there's all sorts of shit you can <laughs> do in the environment. That was it's so cool. <laughs> Parallel, you know, it's like the guys like explain is like if you uh, if you ever like you know what's the first thing you do when you get a handbrake turn, and you figure out you can do it, and you see it done in the movies, you're like. I want to see if I can parallel park. So there's like a there's like a burnout award for there's like parked cars now in the game, and they'll oftentimes they'll be separated like with a space where you can you parallel hand -break park. Turn into and the space. You, you, you handbrake turn and slide into it, and it grades you on how well you did on lining up into the space. What blew me away was the the persistent world nature of it. it I mean, as a multiplayer game, there can only be eight people in the world, but right. it's it's 72 square kilometers, which I I, I googled that. It's 30 <laughs> square miles. Um, 
of roadway, which is pretty pretty big, close to as big as San Francisco. Right. So it's 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 a huge city with a lot of, and it's the main streets and all the back streets. And one of the things it does for the persistence is there are stats for every single stretch of road in the game, and based on your it tracks your buddy list and everyone that's played the game. And reaching a top speed or doing a crash or v the various things that it requires you to do in, in a sandbox world, it's tracking. So if you go down, a, if you boost down a hill and you've boosted down that hill faster than anyone else has ever, the, the, the little tracker in the game will log the fact that you have the record for that stretch of road and then everyone else in the game will then be judging their performance in that in that part of the world against you and that that applies to absolutely everything wait, wait how does it work like if if you have the record and i go visit that road the it game's going to tell so me so if, if if you and me are on, on each other's so it'll it'll say it, it'll track who has the record for that thing right and if we're on our friends list it will make a bigger deal of the fact okay. that your it'll be like your friend jwhd has the record on this stretch of road and it'll sort of goad you into trying to beat it Oh, okay. well, which then kind of builds on the next mechanic, which is that what happens when that starts to occur in the game that you guys are both in is if it's your record and he's if, like beating it, then you're going to go see where he is on the map mm -hmm. and go try and wreck him out. Right. So, I mean, there's, oh. there's some... There's some crackdown cool. persistence to it in the it does these joinable games and you can you, eight of you can be in the world at once and it, it, because it's all sandbox there's no contrived events right. per se well, in I the game. I love you you start your own like races. Yeah, like, you're so making you, your own game right, in so the you world. Pull, you pull up at the stoplight and you pull um, L2 and R2 and all the other cars at the stoplight you are then racing against. And if one of the cars near that, within the catchment area of that race challenge, if one of them happens to be one of you guys, you can say if you want to join in the race or not. So it's not like Test Drive where, where it, was, it was free, but there was still an element of it being contrived. Like you could challenge other players in the world, but the races themselves were at set locations. You can start a race wherever there are other cars. And it can be a one-on-one -on -one or it can be an eight-player race. And you, you know, there's the things you can do. And then the crashes are the same. It's not, it's not those sort of massively sort of orchestrated, almost like you know playing crazy golf with cars thing. Now, you drive along and you see a bunch of cars. You hit L1 and R1, and it flips the car up in the air. And then the challenge is to make the crash last for as long as you possibly <laughs> can. It's almost like a rhythm game element. It's a rhythm game then, because yeah. as the car hits the ground, if you hit X, it will bounce the car back up into the air. And then you want to hit other cars. And again, if you're in the world and you see me doing a crash, you can come and give me a nudge to help me go keep going further along. Or we can join in the crash and do it together. And we're bouncing off each other and, and doing shit in the world. So you can... There's these sort of collaborative... Like so, I mean, I, I would imagine that if you get eight like-minded people, like we're going to do a crash and we're going to crash together, and we're going to see if we can crash from the top of this hill to the beach, and like by bouncing into each other and trying to it's do like the synch it gets like, synchronized crash. Right. Well, he was saying that there are elements of the crash game where, whereas before it was like playing golf with cars, now he said it's a combination of Katamari and Madden with cars. <laughs> well, that, that's a weird combination. <laughs> <laughs> weird. I think I think you have to talk about other graphics because we've seen Burnout Revenge on Xbox 360, which was like an Xbox game with a little better lighting, mm -hmm. you know. And after coming from that to this, it looks so much better. There's so much shit. In oh, the this world. game is hot. The crashes <laughs> as the cars are buckling and it just looks beautiful. Like mm -hmm. it looks it looks really good. I was, I was you remember that demo? Where which? Was that a 360 press conference where they showed that car well, that, that crashing demo, into the that wall? That demo was by Pseudo, the guys who went on right. to full auto. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was Pseudo. That that's was right. It was when the original XNA demos, before Xbox 360 was ever even announced. Okay, so you remember those demos? Yeah. The crashes real time in this game look like that. Yeah, they do. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, that killed me. I was like, whoa, that's... That's exactly like what we the, saw in that press conference. To keep the persistent world and the, the sandbox unique, one of the things that they've changed fairly dramatically from... So crashes are back, traffic checking is back. Like a lot of the stuff that was taken out for Dominator are back, but in a different way in this. But with one, the interesting thing is that if you hit something head-on, previously that was it, there was a crash and there'd be a crash animation, it would reset the car. In this, if you crash into something, there was one of the crashes that, that and, it, and again, it's all you know based on how you hit the thing, things will crumple. I was in the Stallion, which is like the Mustang kind of car, and there was this like shitty old van coming around a corner. I hit it so hard that my car just tore through the thing, and it like just bust open this van wow. completely. It fucked my car up completely. But there's a rule in Burnout that if you if you crash in a way that you still have four wheels, you can drive away from it. <laughs> so I basically drove through this van, came out. The, there was this spectacular animation where there was all this shit going everywhere. My car's getting all crumpled up, and it. 
it sort of bounced out of the back of this van and it's like in pieces behind me. <laughs> and then I jabbed on the accelerator and I wheel span and started and started driving again. It was wow. just like so much more well, satisfying another, than another really cool satisfying thing is if you're playing multiplayer and you and you crash into somebody, if you have the uh, PlayStation Eye camera or presumably the Xbox camera, whatever that's called, mm -hmm. like it snaps a picture of them. Oh, the look on their face. The look on their face when they get killed. So they were and showing it. it. <laughs> yeah. That's why they were showing it on PS3 yeah. is they had the PS3 camera there and that was so cool because they were playing it with uh, someone back at Redwood Shores. Mm -hmm. And like I, I was whenever you'd wreck, it was like they talked, so I was talking to him about that and they are like, well, you know, when we originally did this, we had it set to where it snapped that picture a half second after the takedown. He's like, but we changed it now to where it takes it about two and a half seconds afterwards because what we found was like when people get taken down, they started to want to pose for the picture. And that's exactly what happened is you've got like, you know, like we're, we, we like take down the dude in Redwood Shores and he was like playing one of EA's lounges and he would like have these looks on his face like, ah, it was really funny. Like, you know, like holding his head or like holding his hands up or whatever. It was yeah, really, it really humanized. It. It's, it's kind mm -hmm. of cute. I like it. And you'll be able to save those pictures, and you'll be able to drop them into your friends list and send them to your friends over PS Network like that. I so you'll be able to. Is the 360 version here? I didn't see it. No, no it's not. No, no it was just showing, only, they're just showing on PS. It's only on one part at Barker Hangar. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah, and there, it was, there was a line. <laughs> it was on two pods at the press conference, and that's all they've got. Wow. I well, mean, it's pretty downplayed. I mean, considering how awesome it is. Yeah, and it is really awesome. But I, I guess there wasn't so much waiting for the other racing game that was here to play that was on 360. I, PGR 4? It's good. Yeah. It's, it's fine. It's, it's very competent. I just, I don't know. There was... I, you said you were bored with it. It was kind of I, I gave you that lead-in because you told me you were bored it with was, it. It was just, I mean, it's got bikes now. It's cool. I mean, but you know, Test Drive did that, and but it's a prettier version of. I mean, I, I, I when I was watching it at the press conference, I just thought they shouldn't call it. it it's PGR wet, basically, mm. <laughs> because you know th th there's a lot of nice rain effects, and it snows as well. It's not just rain, and uh, if you'd seen all the videos and screenshots, you would think that in PGR it's raining all the time. It's not, <laughs> um, but it's snowing sometimes. It's snowing sometimes, and it <laughs> is dry sometimes, and it's night and day, and it's, it's you know there's more locations. Competent. It's quite competent. I mean, the thing that things that they have done that are more interesting is the career mode now is a proper career mode, and it's based. It's more character driven than. Uh, it's about you as the driver, not as you as your car collection. It's not car. It's not just chasing points like previously. You were chasing kudos points, or you were chasing race points, and that was it. Now you are specifically racing against seventy-two other like racers in the world and and you are trying to work your way up the rankings against these other characters so that's one probably the biggest change they've made to the structure of the game what could uh what could pgr do then to get you excited i mean it, what could it do i mean it could have been out day, next right? year is how <laughs> it could have excited me right now because we're not done playing forza yet that it's and it's a gt5 prologue right coming around the same time which which apparently looks unbelievable in hd i mean everyone's like no don't even watch don't watch it in in the game trailers window wait till you can watch yeah. it in proper hd yeah all right, so PGR4, what's your, what's your projection on how that's going to do this fall? What do you think it's going to be like? You think it, Are they going to find something to make you interested? Maybe, but I mean, right now, I, uh, I, mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's gorgeous. I mean, it looks way better than the last PGR. But, I mean, it's another fucking racing game on 360. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and, it, and it really is, much, just like PGR3, it is really struggling with, am I a serious racing game or am I an arcade racing game? I'm both and I'm neither. To me, it seemed like the needle was a little more towards arcade this time. A little more, yeah. yeah. And the bikes kind of help that. Yeah. And, it, you know, the, the way they're doing cockpit view on the bikes is kind of interesting in the way that it leans. And but It seems like there'd be some kudo balance issues there because when they demoed it and they showed how quick you could rack up the kudos on the motorcycles, I thought to myself, wow, that's going to make a real imbalance. Well, the way they're balancing part. it is, I mean, you can get kudos by doing wheelies and endos and stuff, but when you're doing those, it's impossible to control, so... Okay. I mean, the kudo system has always been a big point of contention over that game anyway. You, yeah. I mean, your your facial I, expression it, is how a lot of people respond to it. Yeah. I mean, I, I've i always struggled to be really enthusiastic about it. I mean, I can appreciate it, but it's not... Like, you know, Forza's, Forza's doing a very good job on the realistic end. Burnout is going all the way into arcade stuff. And then the next big sim game, as Shane said, that everyone's going to want to play is going to be GT5. 
All right, that's fair enough. Uh, I wanted to change uh, gears completely for a second because I was down at Capcom today and had an actual chance to check out the Zapper. I remember we were talking the other day we about, about the Zapper yesterday, and uh, yeah, I, I like the Zapper. I, I think it's it's good. I, I wish it had more rumble, and I think you agree, right? Well, you don't even really feel the rumble, dude. I mean, it's you, very faint. I was saying, it really I, doesn't I, feel like you know, as much as I hate buying all these batteries to power my various Wii peripherals, like I almost wish they had put like an optional like rumble thing in it for the battery to make it shake. So I played Umbrella <laughs> Chronicles as as you did, Shane, and the first thing I did since we talked about it and we didn't know the answer was I, I stopped and like checked out the uh, the zapper itself and the people at Capcom were really cool they let me like explore it and like this thing is actually really cool it feels good it's made out of the same plastic material as the uh, as the Wiimote so it has that nice you know heavy good weighty solid feel to it the front handle where the Wiimote fits into has a little cord guide and then the that goes down into the handle and curls up under the uh, the heel of your palm and where the nunchuck part fits so it's all very it's all very it's concealed very tightly it's very put together. it doesn't it's feel really it doesn't feel like you've like cobbled this thing together out of rubber bands or something but you, you know? could cobble one together out of <laughs> rubber bands and, and sticks could yes make one in witch shop <laughs> you, wouldn't, you wouldn't come up with anything that works as well as this i mean it works it's it's really nice you the could, other thing sorry you couldn't come up with anything that works as well as this yeah you wouldn't it has it a looks, trigger it has a trigger <sighs> How does I, that actually? How does that work? Is that a mechanical thing that presses the Z button for yeah, you? I believe so. Yeah, yeah, I think it is. Yeah. The, the B button, the B, B the button. whatever the thing on the back yeah, of the Wii's button. Yeah. Z's on the nunchuck, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, you know, I, my point was that most people probably couldn't craft something better for than this. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose someone who was like really good. I just would think have 20, no problem 20 doing bucks that. for a piece of bent plastic is. I don't know. It seems a little, a little much. <laughs> All right, but the idea of it is very cool, and you do feel you do feel like a bat. I mean, let me tell you what: playing Umbrella Chronicles with this thing, you do feel like a badass because it's like you're holding this, you know, Mac 10 submachine gun sort of deal, and you're blasting down the zombies. That part was really cool, but I have to agree, kind of with Shane, that right now I think the sensitivity needs some work because the it's very hard to get the crosshair to stably move well, across the screen. It just and it, it, this jumps, is it jumps around. Specific, what the hell is that? Please quiet your cell phone before <laughs> taping a podcast, Garnet. Well, and I complained that like the headshots, they're kind of hard to do. It's a real skill shot, and you really want to do it because it's a difference of hitting a zombie like eight to ten, ten times versus one hit. So yeah, well, it's all about headshots. It is very much about headshots, and there's lots of stuff that you need to pick up in that game. So it's very you, you need to be able to place the cursor accurately. And right now, that part's not there. But so Umbrella the Chronicles on. is um, House of the Dead, basically, right? It's, mm. but, but it's be, a little more than that. Yeah, and with with yeah. the analog nub, nub where it is now, it kind of feels like an FPS because you are looking around. I wouldldn't go so far as to bit. say it feels like an it's FPS. It's a quasi FPS kind so of. It's not entirely pre. It's not entirely on rails. There is an element of. It's entirely on it's rails. Entirely oh, it is. It's entirely on rails. <laughs> you you just have a. There's a broader field of vision than what yes. it's rendering for yes. you. Yes. Okay. Right. So like with the analog stick, you can you can look to the left, look to the right, which you actually need to do quite a lot because there's stuff in the environment where you need to like blast boxes to get ammo out of it and right. pick up uh, you know extra weapons. Wow. I know, pretty uncommon <laughs> uncommon I mean, deal it there. It is still a arcade light gun game. It's you know it's a slightly evolved. But okay. arcade light gun games are fun. Did you know? I mean, I've had a lot of fun playing arcade light gun games. I watched the video at Nintendo. I saw that chick jumping around, feeling like looking like she was having a really good time. So, <laughs> I'm sold. I thought it was pretty fun. But, but stuff can... like that, light gun games are they're all fun on some level. But you're gonna pay fifty dollars for a light gun game. Well, I think if you're gonna pay and with the Zappa, you're paying another twenty. Yeah. Well, I, I think Ari will have hopefully enough content to make it worth its while and be a long experience. I'm more worried about like Time Crisis Four on PS3 and Ghost Squad. Squad. Yeah, Ghost those Squad. seem like more like things you put fifty cents in and walk away. You know? Yeah, it's like, like the Saturn days, like all these light gun games that you're like you're you know when when Virtual Cop first came out, we were excited about right. it, but then it's like ten minutes later, like. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and hopefully there'll be some more games that take advantage of the zapper, right? Maybe. Well, yeah, I think for for FPSs, that's the whole idea. Is like they wanted to like evolve FPSs on Wii. So we'll, like I think we'll for a, a, a real first person shooter like Medal of Honor, they showed a brief video of that. Like if you use a zapper there, I think that could work because but, no one liked Medal of Honor using the Wii controls. There's still the problem though of centering. Like we, like and you've that's, talked about that's the this, big deal right now, yes, right? Of how to center. How to recenter yourself in an FPS? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and so before we get out of here, let's wrap the show up with the what some people are calling potentially maybe even the game of the show, which you got a little chance because he's a judge to play some today. I've seen the extra trailer of it and have been gushing over it. Well, That's Sean talked about it yesterday on the show as well. Right. It's got to be Call of Duty Four. So, shoot, you play a ton of shooters. What do you think? Of, what do you think of Call of Duty Four? I was excited, but I, I mean, what I played today was essentially Call of Duty 
in a modern era. You know, it's like very action packed. There's shit going on all around you, explosions, and uh, it's just intense, high adrenaline, like very fast paced action. So uh, it, it, it was like, you know what? All they did was slap on modern clothing on people, give, give me a modern machine gun with laser sights. Uh, what I did, like, you know, like there's one part, I, I'm running through this uh, uh, burnt out apartment complex and uh, the lights are all out. So you had to use night vision. But if you have your laser pointers on, you could see where all your your guns your guns are pointing, and then all your teammates and where their guns are pointing. So if you're kind of like in the chaos of war, you're not sure where the enemies are. You just see all these lasers in the That's in the cool. darkness, just all pointing like to the second floor of the building next door. So you like you start to look over there, and you're like, oh yeah, there's a bunch of enemies over there. Uh, so there's like, exciting moments like that. Um, I don't I'm not sure if this was done in a previous Call of Duty. Could you throw grenades back? Was that done before? Like you yes, you could throw. Yeah, you could throw. Okay, all right. So, that's, so I know they did in Medal of Honor. I wasn't sure about COD, but uh, and then uh, the one part that was really awesome, uh, I had to take out these tanks that were driving on a, a highway, an overhead highway, and you could just barely see them. And then you get you picked up this weapon. I forgot what it's called, uh, but you you could. It's an anti tank rocket. Yeah, it's an anti tank rocket, and so uh, the cursor comes up, and then you're locked onto the tank, and you pull the trigger. And then I shot it, and then it looked like I cut, I, pu- I put the uh, rocket launcher down, and I'm like, oh, nothing happened. And a second later, the uh, tank just exploded. I'm like, oh, that was weird. What happened? Is like I thought maybe the game wasn't complete yet. So then I took out the second tank, and the producer who was watching me play is like, oh, this is what's happening. So what happens is you lock onto the tank, you fire this rocket. It's like almost like a fire and forget weapon. It shoots straight up into the air, like hundreds of feet in the air. It's like watching a flare go up into the sky. And then it, it arcs, it, it just shoots straight up and then and then does a 180, arcs straight down, and it just slams into the tank and then explodes. And it's like, wow, this is awesome. This is like, I'm using modern, modern day equipment. You know, this is what... You're so used to like World War II rocket yeah. launchers. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, I have machine guns with laser sights. So it's not like these, those old uh, carbines and stuff, right. you know, that they use in World War II. So it's very exciting and action packed. And what I didn't get to play is what they showed in the trailer at the mm-hmm. Microsoft press conference. Uh, so that I'm excited about too, because then it's a, a more stealthy side to it. Um, but storyline wise it's it's a really cool idea it's about this uh this russian general who uh, like old school guy wants to bring back the glory of mother russia is getting all the support from uh ex kgb guys ex army guys uh and he's going to uh take over russia and then, but what they do to kind of distract the americans they know the americans love a good war they start some shit in the middle east so you're going to fight two campaigns you're going to be uh part of the american campaign in the middle east uh trying to and, and you know, as the American, you don't know that this is all the, the this Russian guy's fault. And then you're also going to play a British SAS soldier in the Russian campaign. And then when I asked him, like, will these two uh, the battles kind of the storylines kind of converge? And he's like. Just gave a big smile. I was like, "Yep, that's a good call." And then, so they have really ambitious plans for like this. Uh, these two different skirmishes happening, in different parts of the world, kind of converging into uh, an almost global battle. So, cool if there was an assault on the U.S. homeland, that'd be awesome. <laughs> That's hey, who knows that might be the expansion pack. Dude, yeah. it, I think this game sounds so tight. What it's interesting to me is after all that, these guys have been busted their humps for a couple of years on their game engine. It doesn't sound like the graphics really overwhelmed you that much compared to their other efforts. Uh, not so much. They're they're fine, you know. I mean, but in that trailer, uh, the part that excited everybody was, uh, you're you're looking at this grassy field and you don't even notice that, but your partner who's completely in camouflage and has all the uh, brush and branches and crap on him, he gets up out of the ground and. Like, like you could hear the audience go kind of woo because no one noticed that guy standing right there. And I was talking for, uh, to a guy from Activision. And he said the the developers have changed where that soldier was a couple of times because they didn't quite like it, and he's had trouble spotting him every time. Mm-hmm. He, like even when you go into it looking for your camouflage partner, you can't find him. And it's real, you know, it's not some fake video game graphical trick. It's he's really there. You just can't see. He blends in so well, you can't see it. And what I like about what was shown in the trailer is. You know, usually when you're playing your Ghost Recons or Rainbow Sixes, you're the guy leading and you're the one commanding the other guys. But the, I don't remember another game where I'm following another guy and he's commanding me. You know, so you're watching him. He has his hand signals and he's like, hey, don't shoot that guy just yet or take him out or he's calling out targets to you. So it seems like that you're 
companion AI is really smart. So I'm really excited to play that part of the game too, that the non-traditional COD, like more stealthy stuff. So you played Call of Duty 2? Yeah, I didn't play 3, but I did play 2. Because you played Call of Duty 2, same developer, Call of Duty 4, just kind of wrap it up with, how do you think the uh, switch from, you know, the very old style weaponry of World War II where you know you didn't have rocket launchers and long range fire and forget weapons and that kind of stuff how much did we able to still have that visceral feel? I mean, when you had the rifle in your hand, did it still have that COD2 feel? Oh, that yeah, punch? yeah. You're, so you're looking down a barrel, you know, you pull in left trigger, you're looking down a barrel, but now you have this high, this huge caliber, high-powered machine gun, right? And it just feels awesome. And uh, the demo, in my demo, they did it really smart because they cranked it up. They had 5.1 surround. <laughs> they turned it up loud, and I'm like, Jesus, you guys you like your audio. It. But it was like rumbling everywhere. You could hear the, the machine gun bullets like boom, 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 boom. And you could hear the echoes of the gunfire happening all around you and it's it's just awesome having like that full uh modern weaponry you know like i had a, a grenade launcher underneath my machine gun like i said the laser sights and all that stuff uh so yeah it was just uh it's a it's a different feeling and it's great to because uh you know all the other games that we're playing with modern uh weapons, uh, you know, your Ghost Recons and Rainbow Six, you're not really unloading, you know, you're not like, I'm just going to go full auto and just go nuts. You got to be a little bit more careful and tactical. But in this game, it's just like, you know what, just go nuts. Just like, just go crazy. That's and just that black thing. Mm -hmm. That's that black thing. But it's gun better gun. than black. It's gun a lot boring. better than black. All right, so good enough to be game of the show contender for you? I, I don't know. For me, I still like Mass Effect. Mm -hmm. All right. I was really impressed with Mass Effect. Well, we got plenty more to uh, come back and visit tomorrow. We'll definitely get the PC guys in as well because we want to talk about Crisis. And I, I saw a couple other PC games. I know Jeff Green actually blogged the other day about, uh, or just today, about how PC games are good too. So we'll get that. Shane's got some more stuff he's seen. Shoo, thanks for hanging out with us, dude. Thanks for having me on, guys. Appreciate it. Don't, uh, don't get in any trouble between now and tomorrow. When we come back tomorrow, we'll have the final show from here in Santa Monica. Until then, we are ghosts.